Good morning, or good afternoon, good evening. Um, we have lots of people joining us from several different time zones. Um, welcome, everyone. I am Isabel Hodge, Executive Director for the US International Council on Disabilities. And as I mentioned a, a few seconds ago, we're, we're really delighted to have over 300 people registered for the 3030 Sports as a tool for advocacy and development event today. Thank you so much. Um, before we have, um, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the USAID website. Um, we are going live right now on Facebook. So if you know of anybody that can access the webinar because we've closed registrations, then they can just go to our Facebook page and see it there. Um, we're using the hashtag sports3030. That's sports3030 for social media. And we really appreciate your, your tweets and posts leading up to this event and your social media posts today, so thank you. Um, I will be posting links in the chat as um, our panelists are speaking, so keep an eye on that. And you have the, the chance to submit questions. We have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end um, for questions, um, so type your questions into the Q&A area. And I see we already have one question, that's wonderful. So we have several media representatives attending today. So please, if you have any inquiries, send them to info at usicd.org. So um, info at usicd.org and I'll post that in the chat um, area too. So let's keep the momentum going by highlighting this important topic in our news outlets. Um, I'd also like to thank our CART and our ASL, American Sign Language Interpreters from Interpreting Sign World. And lastly, if you need any support during this event, then feel free to send me a direct chat message and I'll try to assist. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Candace Cable. Thank you, Izzy, and hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm Candace Cable. I use the pronouns she and her, and I'm the Vice President of the U.S. International Council on Disability, USID, USICD, a nonprofit stakeholder-led membership organization that works worldwide to ensure that people with disabilities and organizations that represent them are fully equipped to advocate for specific effective policies, legislation, and services in the areas of advocacy, convening authentic representation, training, and education to advance domestic and international disability rights and inclusive development. I'm zooming in from the occupied land of Tongva Nation, also known as Los Angeles, California. And for those of you who don't see me, I'm a disabled white woman with shoulder length brown hair and I'm wearing black framed glasses. My blouse is dark blue with light blue hearts all over it. My background is art that I love and there's a round clock up there on the wall of my apartment. And I'm sharing the hosting fun with Isabel, who you just met, who's the executive director of USID. She's going to be behind the camera making all of this work for us. And in front of the camera, myself and the visionary Karen Korb. She will be, uh, we will be introducing you to our esteemed panelists, the organizations that have collaborated with us to bring you this esteemed panel today, Charlotte mclean Lapo, Victor Khaleesi, Keith Jones, Ann Cody, and Vladimir Chuk. And the topic, which is sports as tool for advocacy and development, hashtag sports 3030. So why the number 3030? because of Article 30 and the 2030 Agenda. Let me tell you more. We think you should know more about the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, and all of the articles. The CRD, CRPD is the most comprehensive human rights document ever written because it includes everyone, and no other human rights document before that included everyone. 
Today, our focus is on Article 30 of the CRPD that states participation in cultural life, recreation, leisure, and sport is a right for all persons with disabilities, just as it is for everyone. And from our perspective, sport is not just for play and entertainment. It's an underused, powerful tool for advocacy, development, collaboration, and so much more. Sport's power is that it's connected to humanity and it brings intrinsic language of inclusion front and center. Sport has a friendly face, people like it, and sport is a conversation starter that once started is easy to shift educating and advocating for cohesive change and opportunities that are equitable and accessible to everyone. This panel will deeply educate us on how to shift the shallow perspective of sport to an expansive tool. When we talk about sports, we mean all sports, recreation to elite sports, including clubs, esports, Deaf Olympics, Gay Olympics, Special Olympics, Paralympic. It all has value in constructing a just and equitable society. And why the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, the 2030 Agenda? Because we all need to be educated on what the world is working on, the needs and how we can advocate for equity, access and opportunities for everyone. In 2015, I was attending the Conference of the States Parties for the CRPD held at the UN, talking excitedly with a colleague from Uganda about the new SDGs, how disabled people were mentioned 11 times over the 17 goals and how we weren't even mentioned at all in the Millennium Development Goals of 2000. He asked me what goal I thought was most important. And I said, eradicating poverty, goal number one. He said, Candace, the US is such a bubble. Goal 11, sustainable cities and communities is the most important to us. If we don't have access in communities that embrace us, we can't thrive and contribute. He meant we, disabled people, when he said us. In the UN report, it stated that around 2.5 billion more people will be living in cities by 2050. We must develop cities that work for all people and we can't forget our rural environments either. Non-disabled and disabled people have to know how to advocate together and collaborate for everyone. It's a pretty big pie out there and there's enough for any, everyone. And we hope that this panel, you after this panel, you come away with more ideas like that. Our intentions for this webinar are to introduce you to USID. We are a membership organization and we want you to be a part of our work and collaborate with us and our grassroots movement. We wanna introduce you to our collaborator on this webinar, the Foundation for Global Sports Development and Sidewinder Films and their work. USID believes collaboration is a key factor in our changing world. We want to introduce you to this panel of esteemed leaders that are working in the world and disability communities and how sport has connected to their work. We want to bring forward ideas that may, maybe you not, you haven't thought of. Maybe there's an epiphany or two today. And we wanna educate about this CRPD and the SDG agendas. We will be putting links in the chat as Isabel said, and if you can't access those, we'll have more information on our website and this webinar is recorded, so we'll be using it as a teaching tool. Now, channeling my Paralympic self and in the spirit of sports, I'm going to toss the ball to Karen Korb, an esteemed leader in her work with policy and public health, and she's a Paralympian. Catch, Karen. Oh yeah, let me catch it so I can toss it 42 times so I can get my first serve into the box. <laughs> hey everybody, we're so happy that you could join us today. Uh, my name is Karen Korb and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And a brief physical description, I'm a disabled white woman, wheelchair user with long multicolored blonde-esque hair. I'm wearing a beige multi-pattern top and a beige background. I'd also like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional land of the first people of New Jersey, the Muncie Lenape people, past and present, and honor with deep gratitude the land itself and the Muncie Lenape tribe. I'm a two-time Paralympian in the sport of wheelchair tennis, and I currently work for and with Lakeshore Foundation in Policy and Advocacy. Lakeshore Foundation, as some of you may know, is an Olympic and Paralympic training site. We're also 
the High Performance Management Organization of USA Wheelchair Rugby. And also located on our campus is the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability, as well as the University of Alabama Birmingham's Research Collaborative. I'm both personally and professionally super excited about the discussion today focused on Article 30 of the CRPD, which is a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and goal 11 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, I am very proud to share just some of the details of our collaborators today. The Foundation for Global Sports Development, whose mission it is to deliver and support initiatives around the world that promote accessible, fair, and abuse-free sport for youth. Sidewinder Films is the media division of GSD and promotes this mission to a broader audience through groundbreaking films and documentaries. Global sports development is recognized as having consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Through grants and partnerships, the foundation's work supports many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Working with organizations like Kids Play International, the International Table Tennis Federation, and the Aguitas Foundation, GSD has witnessed powerful impact sport can have in promoting inclusion, gender equality, health, education, and peace. International development is just one of the foundation's focus areas. Global sports development also supports domestic groups like the Challenged Athletes Foundation, which supports adaptive sports equipment, grants, camps, and clinics for people with disabilities. GSD and Sidewinder Films have produced a documentary short called Positive All the Way, which celebrates the power of adaptive sport and illustrates how the International Paralympic Committee is a global force for social change. The film can be viewed on PBS and we're going to share a snapshot of the film with you right now. Isabel, would you mind playing that video? This is one of those times where I'm so happy that I'm not that person trying to figure it out. And here we go. Every single person that shows up there and has an incredible story of resilience, that's what the Paralympic movement stands for. Getting somebody who has the ability to press the button and say, we'll do it, was the key to it. It can be a very lonely environment if you are shunned by society because you're not normal. And so you have to go out there and say, I'm very normal. So without further ado, I have the absolute privilege of introducing our first panelist, our first guest. And Charlotte, I really, I have to share the first time that I ever met you um, a bunch of years back at the United Nations. I saw you sitting in your chair and I thought, oh my God, look at her. And I remember, I think I even said that to you. And then as I got to know you, I thought to myself, wow, you know, women and girls with disabilities don't necessarily have these really powerful role models who are in leadership positions. So I applaud you. And I remember listening to you speak that day and I thought, I really want to be more like her. So Charlotte McLean Chapo. She is the global disability advisor for the World Bank Group. Her work at the bank focuses on disability inclusive development under its twin goals to end poverty and promote shared prosperity. As disability advisor, she supports operational teams across the entire institution to ensure that bank policies, programs, and projects are disability inclusive. In 2011, she was appointed by President Obama to lead the United States Agency for International Development's work on disability inclusive development. She also worked as a senior operations officer at the World Bank in the East Asia Pacific and Africa regions. Earlier in her career, she was appointed by President Nelson Mandela 
as a commissioner to the South African Human Rights Commission, where she focused on social and economic rights, disability rights, and the rights of children. From 1996 to 1998, she worked for UNICEF as a child protection officer. Charlotte holds multiple law degrees in international law and administration from the University of Warsaw in Poland and Cornell Law School in Ithaca, New York. She is currently based in Washington, DC. We are so excited to have you with us today. Welcome, Charlotte. And thank you for being with us and sharing your insight. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, and I remember meeting you as well very well. Thanks for that warm intro. Um, and I'd like to start off by saying that my pronouns are she, her. I am brown and I identify as a black woman with a disability. I use a manual wheelchair. Today I'm wearing a black turtleneck. I have a silver um, necklace and uh, silver hoops and I'm wearing green aviator shaped glasses. I have my hair tied back in a, in a bun and I'm working from home like many of us are today. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I am not a Paralympian. Um, but I am a keen watcher of, of sports and um, we would like to share with you today some of the work that we've been doing at the World Bank and more importantly share with you what I think are some important lessons going forward. And with that I'll ask Izzy to pull up my presentation. Charlotte, can you see your presentation? I can. Um, I'm going to ask you, Izzy, to move it to the next slide and to, if you can, to try and put it in, in full screen. Okay. Or in presentation mode. I'll get started as um, Izzy figures out how to get this onto the full screen. Um, and maybe just to pick up on the points that were mentioned by Candice. Um, we're talking about 3030 today and repetition is good here. We're talking about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 30, that speaks to participation in culture, life, recreation, leisure and sports. And in addition to that, the article speaks about the importance of mainstreaming sport activities at all levels. But it also points to a twin track approach, which enables disability specific activities also to, to be in place. So it's important to understand that that article looks both at mainstreaming, but also the support of disability specific um, sporting activities. We then have the SDG 11, which is, um, as Candice mentioned, part of the 2030 agenda. And, sorry, Izzy, I'm gonna wait until you. Sorry, we're having some challenges okay. here. Can you see it? I can, but we're back to the, to the yeah. earlier screen. So this is Candace, and on the bottom right of your screen, there's it says notes and it's highlighted. If you go all the way over to the fourth icon, try that one to open it up to full screen. Oh, it's it's not doing it for you. You know, I can I can just continue to go. I mean, I know what's on the what's coming up with the slide, so I'll carry on talking in the interest of time if that's okay. And if if we sort it out, then great. Um, so SDG 11 is important. Yeah, because said they're going up there. I'm sorry. Izzy, can I go ahead? Yep, go ahead. Great. So I just wanted to pick up on the point that was raised by Candace uh, around the importance of having inclusive cities and ensuring that cities are safe and resilient and sustainable. 
and we recognize or they recognize that sports is a contributor to the empowerment of individuals. Um, and it's really important when we think about cities that we ensure that cities are built in a way that, are, that they are inclusive from the get go. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize that if we don't adhere and implement Article 30 of the CRPD and the CRPD uh, writ large, and if we aren't able to meet the, 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 the sustainable development goals, all 17, including 11, we will not, we will not, we will, in, we will definitely leave people behind and um, very often or most often those will be persons with disabilities. Next slide. So the next slide really speaks to the World Bank's enabling environment and what we have been able to do um, in advancing disability inclusion. And I will come to the issue around sports in a bit, but just quickly to say that the bank itself, the World Bank itself is not a typical bank. It's a developing bank, the development bank that supports countries to develop um, their economies, uh, their human capital, and it, and it does so by providing grants, concessional loans, technical assistance, and really helping countries to meet the sustainable development goals, as well as um, the, uh, ensure that they're implementing the CRPD. So what we've done internally to advance this week is to, to advance this work is to develop 10 policy commitments um, on disability inclusive development that were launched at the Global Disability Summit that happened in London two and a half years ago um, that was organized by IDA and um, the government of the UK and the government of Kenya. Um, in addition to this, we have a bank-wide environmental social framework that sets out some very key safeguards for how to ensure that persons with disabilities, including other excluded groups, are included in World Bank projects. And then more recently, we have the IDA-19 replenishment. And essentially what the IDA-19 replenishment is, is it's a very large fund for the poorest countries to be able to get grants to support their work around meeting the SDGs, but meeting other development goals that they may have in, uh, in place in their own countries. What's exciting about the IDA-19 um, policy commitments this time is for the first time ever, we now have commitments that make specific reference to persons with disabilities. And in so doing, we expect to see an uptake of disability in projects that are being developed um, at country level. And then we also recently put out a social development strategy, which is a larger strategy that addresses how we can ensure that we are reaching some of the most vulnerable people. Within that, there's a very strong part of it that speaks to disability inclusion. And that's been important for us to advance the work internally. So moving on from our enabling environment, I wanted to, you can click the next slide, Izzy. I wanted to share with you the approach that the bank has taken and certainly my team has taken to advancing disability in our work. The first is to support meaningful stakeholder engagement. So what does this mean? This means if we're running a project in country X, we always are required to have consultations, to have stakeholder consultations. And now we have an additional requirement that insists that persons with disabilities participate in those processes. For us, it's important to go beyond just having persons present, but to be there and to be able to participate in a meaningful way and ensure that we have meaningful engagement. Another pillar of our work is to provide technical assistance and advisory service to the bank. Uh, the bank has over 20,000 people working for it all over the world, and they come from different sectors of development. And so my team provides technical assistance on disability inclusion to this large, large group of um, development professionals. 
the third pillar of our work is to lead on um, lead on the evidence, the development of new evidence, um, and shape intellectual leadership on disability inclusion, collect better data, and really make a strong case uh, for disability inclusion, which is important if we're to design good policies and, and programs. And then our fourth pillar is to increase the client demand. Um, and in our case, our clients are the country governments. So we work through governments and it's important for them to start saying, we would like to have projects that are disability inclusive. So let's move to the next slide. So I wanted to just sp spend a minute and talk about why sports is good for development. Um, and I think Candace began to start to talk about that but I think we know that there is the con there's a the convening power of sports, and we know that it can be a very, very powerful vehicle for social inclusion. We know that sports provides opportunities to meet people, different people from different parts of the world. Um, so it's good for interaction, it enhances relationships, and it can address issues around overcoming hostility. We know that sport can also offer safe and supportive environments, which foster self-confidence and can increase readiness of individuals to become involved in society. And we know very well that sport can often be used to fight exclusion and contribute to the integration of marginalized groups into society. And then we also know that sports can be a social classroom where social skills such as teamwork, organizational skills, and how to handle strong emotions in a constructive manner are learned. And this is by far not the exhaustive list of why sports is good for development. I did wanna pick up on something that I think Karen said is that it could also be very important for addressing aspects around peace and cohesion. So can we go to the next slide? So as I mentioned earlier, some of the work that my team does is to provide advisory service and build the analytics on disability writ large, but including on issues related to sports and culture. And so I will just spend a minute talking about two projects. One project is in the Democratic Republic of Congo because our work is international work and so we work globally. And this particular piece of work was a study that was put in place to identify sports and cultural activities that enhance resilience, optimism, social well being of vulnerable children and youth. And it had a strong component that looked at sports for children and young people with disabilities. The second project in which advisory services around, around disability inclusion um, that I'd like to talk to is. Uh, project called Sports for Development, which is in Ethiopia. And the objective of this particular project was to support the government of Ethiopia on information uh, and technical assistance on how to use sports and very importantly, play activities to improve social cohesion and, he and help young disadvantaged boys and girls to acquire skills and build their ability to ensure that they can contribute to a peaceful and more resilient society. So those are a few of the projects where we've had uh, an inroad in terms of addressing the issue of sports for development. Next slide. This is so, the in interpreter. Can am we get I talking too fast? Nope. Can we get a switch of interpreter? We need a new spotlight for the next interpreter, please. Okay. Thank you. All good? Great. So what I wanted to share as I wrap up is some of the lessons learned. And I think, as I mentioned the two, in the two previous projects that I re referenced, they're typically couched as sports for vulnerable children or vulnerable youth or disadvantaged youth or vulnerable youth. What's really important is that when we design projects, we need to ensure that we have, we have deliberate and explicit indicators 
that mention disability. And we need to do this, otherwise persons with disabilities are just left out and may be mentioned as a mere footnote, but we're not collecting the data on it. And we're really not addressing the issue with um, the proper support that it requires. As mentioned both by, by both of the earlier speakers, what's also really important as we advance the agenda of, of sports for development in terms of disability is to ensure that we take the twin track approach so that we mainstream and ensure that the basic needs of persons with disabilities are met, but that we also target and ensure that the specific needs of individuals with disabilities are met. And then I can't say this enough. It's absolutely essential that when we think about design, designing projects, programs, whatever it is that we're doing, we have to ensure that we're including the aspects of disability from the get-go. It has to be done that way. Otherwise, trying to go back and retrofit is always really difficult and often doesn't happen. So my last slide, please, Izzy. My last slide speaks to some exciting partnerships because partnerships are really important for advancing the agenda around sports for development. And it was interesting as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I found some information that, that, that pointed to the fact that Jim Wolfenson, who was the former president of the World Bank had been an honorary board member of the IPC. Um, and that really excited me. In some ways, I felt it was important for me to mention that. And then I also wanted to share with, with uh, everybody on this call that I'm currently a member of the IPC's hashtag We the 15 campaign. And we're really looking forward to seeing how we can advance um, disability inclusion in sports and how we can really build sports for development. Um, and I think that was my last slide. Thank you, Charlotte. This is Candace. Thank you so much. And that is really exciting news that you're part of that campaign. I, I didn't know that. When, uh, when does the campaign start or has it already started? So we have a steering we have a steering committee that's um, in place, uh, and the campaign is kicking off shortly. Oh, is it? And this is Candace. It sounds like it. It's going to be in full, full steam ahead by the time the Paralympics come to Tokyo. That's the plan. Oh, oh, can't wait to hear more about this. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Our next panelist is uh, Victor Clisi, as commissioner. Of the, mayor, of the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Victor advocates for disability community in all city decision making. That's a big one. And as commissioner, he chairs the Accessibility Committee of the City Building Code and leads efforts to integrate people with disabilities into the workplace through NYC at Work, an employment initiative. He also ensures that disability is at the forefront of the city's emerging technologies, including communication modes, autonomous vehicles, and dig digital access. Recognized as an expert on disability, he has authentic lived experience. The commissioner frequently participates in national and international conferences. A dedicated public servant, Victor previously led efforts within the Department of Parks and Recreation to make the city's park system one of the most complex in the world, accessible in accordance with the inclusive design guidelines. And I think he has a really cool announcement for us today. Victor is an avid athlete and competed in the 1998 Paralympic Games as a member of the US national hockey team. And that's actually where Victor and I met for the first time. We were on the same Paralympic team in 98 in Japan, but different sports. I was not a hockey player. I was a cross country skier. <laughs> he is a native New Yorker and he's married with two daughters and I'm really thrilled to have Victor here today with us. The floor is yours, Victor. Thank you, Candace. Hello everyone. It's uh, great to be here. My name is Victor Khaleesi. 
Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And a lot of people from around the world. I saw people from Lebanon and people from Brazil, people from uh, Pennsylvania and Oklahoma. So it's great to have such a wide variety of people joining this call. And prior to me, um, to me coming to city government, I, as you heard, I was involved in adaptive sports. And that really drove me to the advocacy that I have today. I realized that in New York City, we didn't provide the opportunities that other places did around the country of the United States of America. Uh, specifically, I saw a lot of things happening in, in um, Philadelphia, uh, the city of Philadelphia. And I was jealous. And I had an opportunity to meet with the parts commissioner one day, because we were bidding for the Olympic and Paralympic games for 2012 that eventually went to London. And I told him, I said, it'd be great if we made parks accessible for people with disabilities. And lo and behold, he hired me. And that really began, began my advocacy change uh, of working to make New York City the most accessible city in the world. And that's a big undertaking. And those are uh, really big goals, but we are New York, we think big, and we have to provide big. And I did so by working for the Parks Department, ensuring that everything we did had a disability lens. It started with our design and construction, looking at our design and construction and saying, hey, you know what? The codes and standards that we have are minimal. And that's a floor. We have to go ceiling. And we did, and we go over and beyond all of our ADA codes and standards to ensure that disability is fully integrated. And I'm not talking about people with physical disabilities like myself. I'm talking about people with cognitive disabilities, people with visual disabilities, and people with hearing disabilities. And we, and, we, and we look to incorporate that into our playgrounds and into our public spaces. And I would argue that New York City is the most accessible park system in the country, if not the world, because we've done a lot of work and our guidelines prove that. So my advocacy brought me into city government um, at, the, at a high level being appointed commissioner of the mayor's office for people with disabilities, both in the May, um, Mayor Bloomberg administration and now Mayor de Blasio administration. And I always wondered what did our office do? And I had lots of sleepless nights when I came into it. And we came up with something called Accessible NYC. And it's a state of persons with disabilities living in New York City. And we tackled five areas at the time, employment, healthcare, transportation, housing, and education. And we've expanded that. And we write a yearly report on that to hold ourselves responsible. We are up to a lot of different uh, areas, not just those five. Now we're in healthcare, transportation, education, transportation, technology, financial empowerment. So we keep driving and thinking differently. But what ended up happening uh, as we moved forward was COVID-19 and the pandemic ripped New York City apart. And we have to slowly piece that back together. And doing that, we made sure um, that our last annual report that we just published for Accessible NYC really touched on COVID. What's the future of healthcare? What's the future of work? How do we improve transportation as we're redesigning our streets during COVID-19? I now sit on uh, the big, one of the biggest transportation sy uh, systems board, the MTA in New York City, driving for more accessibility, driving um, to make sure that our paratransit systems get bigger and better. And we've been happy um, during COVID that we were able to put together something called the um, Inclusive Recreation Guidelines. And I'm holding them up right now. And it's a book that has a picture of uh, New York City and a field in front of it. 
And the inclusive design guidelines, uh, recreation design guidelines, look at amusement rides, recreation boating facilities, exercise machines and equipment, and then moving on, and that's just some of them. And then moving on to sports, how do we make our ice rinks accessible for people with disabilities? Archery, beat ball, bowling, cycling, sled hockey, table tennis. And these guidelines are all in one book because I know a lot of athletes with disabilities as they look for these guidelines have to look at all different types of websites. We thought we'd bring it together in one place and you can find these all on our website at nyc.gov slash disabilities. And along with that, we've also made sure that we our program addresses people with disabilities. We've started programs for kids with disabilities, uh, uh, specifically um, wheelchair basketball and sled hockey. And then realizing that we didn't have all the tools that we needed to provide for everyone. So we've teamed up with great organizations that help kids with cognitive disabilities, like Kids Enjoy Exercise Now and um, Extreme Kids and Crew to really guide us through the process, use our recreation centers to make sure that we are providing for everyone throughout the city of New York. I think um, I'll stop there um, and a brief description of what I look like, which I failed to do. I am a white male in a wheelchair wearing all black salt and pepper hair with clear glasses and the background has a map and some trophies of uh, oh, actually awards that have been presented to me. So I wanna say thank you. I look forward to the conversation and um, I, it's great to be surrounded by such great panelists today. Thank you so much, Victor. We so appreciate your insights and what's happening in New York City and beyond. Um, thank you and your team for your broad and expansive work where you've prioritized everything inclusive in New York City and globally. And I believe we all echo the prioritization of inclusion in our current world and in our post-pandemic world. So let's talk about Keith Jones for a minute. You know, I got a little story about Keith Jones as well. I met Keith Jones a couple of years ago. We were both stranded at an airport and I have no idea where, uh, somewhere. And I saw him waiting in line. And uh, I was like, you know, do that wheelchair thing because he's in his chair at the time. And I was like, hey, what's up? And it turns out that uh, he was, I did not know him, and but I knew of him. And I said, you really look familiar. And as we got to talking, he shared a few of his details. And I was literally, as awestruck then as I am now. Um, he wound up getting out of the airport on uh, his VIP points and I wound up staying and sleeping at the airport in the maternity lounge. So there's our little story, Keith. So it is an absolute privilege to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Keith Jones. Keith Jones is the president and CEO of Soul Touch and Experiences an organization aimed at bringing a multifaceted perspective to the issues of access, inclusion, and empowerment, which affect him as well as others who are also persons with a disability. To achieve this multicultural cross-disability education and outreach efforts, he collaborates and conducts trainings with the purpose of strengthening efforts to provide services and information with and for people with disabilities. The issues he tackles are expansive from immigration, criminal justice reform, healthcare, and environmental justice, to name but a few. Paralleling with his policy and social justice work, Mr. Jones is a multi talented artist who, along with Leroy Moore and the late Rob Temple, founded Crip Hop Nation, which is an international collection of artists with disabilities. Crip Hop Nation is currently celebrating 13 years with the recent success of their title song for the Netflix documentary of the Paralympic Games, also the same name of the track, which is Rising Phoenix. And it is currently critically acclaimed and nominated for a BAFTA award. Keith is an artist, 
His art and policy work have combined under his publishing company, Soulful Media Works, with the book titled, For You, Young Black Disabled Men. Keith, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you all for inviting me and thank you to the panel for allowing me to join such distinguished guests. Um, thank you, Karen, for embarrassing me about my VIP points. I didn't have VIP points. I just knew how to talk really good to get out. And we were stranded in Milwaukee because it was snow. Uh, but again, I want to thank you all for, for having me. And um, how I came to this work, because we're talking about sustainable communities and sports. Uh, just to give you a brief history of myself, I grew up pre-ADA in America as an African-American male. Um, and before I go on, let me give you a visual description. I'm an African-American male sitting up against a neutral black ground in a black chair with a blue shirt on. I have a visible disability, which we call cerebral palsy. When we speak about sports and its ability to bridge gaps and to change people's perspectives, it started for me uh, in St. Louis in the 70s. My cousins and I would play football in the backyard. And then when my cousin went out to play in a league, Matthew Dickey, I wanted to be like my cousin. We had played before. When I showed up to try out, that is when my human condition became an impediment to my sport or to my competitive spirit. I, at, the, at the time being like eight or nine, I didn't really understand what it meant to all of a sudden, oh, he can't play football because he might get hurt, which for me goes kind of like, isn't that what you do in football? But it understood, it underscored, and what is the larger issue on the global stage in terms of policy. We can craft policy, but if our human condition is at the center of bias, then we are not gonna have full effective policy. The 3030 and the sustainable city goals, particularly in addressing inclusion into arts, culture, and every aspect of non-employment life, that is life. So social experiences as we sit at the intersection of public policy, community, and economic development, understand that if you take care of the people who need the most help, First, they're not begging, they're not asking, they're only requiring for you not to be an impediment for their human condition to exist in the best state that they can see. So when you talk about sport and sustainable cities, in the United States, sports has been used as a tool for social justice. We are now in 2021. Last year when coronavirus showed up on our shores, there was an issue with the NBA and the NBA had shut down. Didn't shut down the second, the second time in behind COVID, it shut down in behind social justice. Sports in America, particularly for people of color, has been used as a platform to elevate our voices. And when you add disability to it, that really helps. Except for the fact that people with disabilities have been consistently silent on any stage outside of pity, outside of charity, outside of, oh, that's so nice, the young black man with a disability wants to run a company. We must start addressing the issue that policy, systemic policy and policy changes, particularly as using sports as an indicator. If you show people that just because you have a varying human condition, you still can be competitive. Just because you have a varying human condition, you still can be brilliant in whatever endeavor you would you achieve. Just because of your human condition, if you use your skill sets, if you are able to apply yourself, you can improve your human condition or your socioeconomic status. What we have seen, whether working in Africa, the South in South America, in the cities of America, on the West Coast or in the East Coast, there are challenges that are not endemic to the community, but to policymakers at large. 
what do we see in sustainable cities and sports going forward post COVID? What will we see in the global stage in terms of the Conference on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Well, we have to come back this time next year to convince world leaders that a segment of your society is worthy of their humanity and is worthy of policy that does not inhibit or prohibit, but expands and accelerates. Can we get to a monetary policy that doesn't penalize you solely for a human condition or acquiring a human condition that changes your ability in whatever fashion? Where we are now in 2021 is that if we are still trying to convince world leaders that 15% of the population, 1 billion, is worthy, then we have to ask them, do we, oddly enough, we don't grow on trees. We have families. So if I am one of 1 billion by abstention with a mother and a father, we are now half the planet. So if we start addressing our policy and thinking about how can we be human centric? How can we talk about the continuum of the life, lifespan? So it's nice that I have a law with 400 steps, but when I get to a point and I have a bad ankle, then I'm going to wish I had an elevator. If we can start concentrating on the human and their talents, as opposed to the limitation. But this also goes to the larger discussion of sports, culture, and how it plays out. So we're looking forward to moving the discussion forward, but we also must ground it in reality that there is sexism in sports, there's xenophobia in sports, transphobia and racism and socioeconomic disparities to even accessing sports programs. That being said, with the World Bank, with the United Nations, with the Council and the Conference and issues developing human rights documentation, we can address those very specifically. We can also very much delete any of the over, over policy making where people start, well, it would be nice if every human has a right to life, love, happiness, and sport, irrespective of their geographical location and or human condition. And it is incumbent upon us, us as leaders to acknowledge what is our own personal bias, what are things that may impede our ability to write a sustainable policy that takes into environmental health, physical health, social, emotional health, economic prosperity, and the ability to integrate into your larger society. If you build a stadium with no wheelchair seating, by abstention, you're telling me I'm not welcome. If there's no way to get into your restaurant, I am not welcome. If I fly and you leave my wheelchair in the city in which I left, I'm not welcome. We can change this dynamic by having real substantive discussions about where the intersection of religion, ethnicity, race, gender, and the human condition impacts negatively in our, so in our public policy. So I'm looking forward to what happens in Tokyo if we're lucky to get to go and perform Rising Phoenix. Um, it is something to be said though, the spirit of sport. A child who is nonverbal, who has an attendant assisting them to play, you don't need words to see their joy. If that's where we can get to with our public policy and our public mandate in terms of expressing and understanding that we are interconnected, our independence is interdependent our ability to make effective public policy understands that we need to take into account the entirety of the human continuum. And with that, I thank you for your time. I look forward to any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith, so much. Thank you for bringing forward that human-centered policy is, and infrastructure is where we need to be and all of those pieces that we have to have in place to really be an inclusive and equitable society. Yeah, and uh, we've got people in the chat that want your contact information as well as the other panelists. So uh, if you want to share it, feel free to do that. Sure, uh, it, 
My email is K is in Keith, P is in Paul, J is in Joan, John, J O N E S, K P Jones at the soul toucher.com. And that's D is in David, A S O U L T O U C H A dot com. The soul toucher.com. K P Jones at the soul toucher.com. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Our next panelist is Ann Cody. Ann Cody is a special advisor with the US Department of State and oversees the international disability rights portfolio, which is designed to combat discrimination and abuse against persons with disabilities globally and to promote the rights, dignity and full inclusion of all people with disabilities on an equal basis with others. After two decades in private and nonprofit sectors, Anne joined the State Department's Fort Diplomacy Division in 2014. She infused disability rights into the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs and the Space Exchanges, as well as initiated mentorship program focused on promoting disability rights through sport. A Paralympic gold athlete, Anne previously held leadership positions with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee International Paralympic Committee and the International Olympic Committee. She is a recipient of the Paralympic Order, the George M. Sten Steinbrenner Sport Leadership Award for contributions to Olympic and Paralympic sport and an honorary doctorate from the State, of State University of New York at Cortland. And I have a couple of things I'd like to share. One is uh, Anne and I have known each other for a long time. We raced against each other in wheelchair racing. And we had the great good fortune to qualify for the Olympic exhibition events. And that meant that we were in wheelchair races that were held during the Olympic games and considered an exhibition, but we were on the Olympic stage. And in 1988, that just wasn't happening. That exposure wasn't happening for athletes that were competing at a, a Paralympic level. And that experience, I think not only was life-changing for us, but it was also very life-changing for people that saw it. I know many people that had new spinal cord injuries that saw us and were just, I want to do that. But the thing that I really want to share about Anne is the time we spent together between the Olympics and the Paralympics. It was such a great time because we were competitors really, and we didn't know each other very well. And during that time, we were able to get to know each other and bond better and, and, and then connect. And so when we went into the Paralympic games, it felt like I had this comrade that I, I knew and, and that you know I could watch her events you know, even though we were all competing against each other, I could still watch her events and, and, uh, and feel really grateful for that experience. And secondly, I'd like, we'd like to congratulate Anne because today the International Paralympic Committee just released the shortlist for the 2021 International Women's Recognition finalists and Anne's on that shortlist. So we wish you great success with that. And really welcome to this panel, Anne. Thank you so much, Candace. That was such a beautiful personal introduction. I, I really appreciate it. I'm so touched by it. So we did really become comrades as wheelchair racers and especially as women wheelchair racers because there was a lot of work to do to um, ensure that the sport was growing and developing. So it was so fun to be able to be in that work with you and so many other people. So it's a thrill to be here on the panel today. I'll just give you a, a brief description of me. I am a white middle-aged woman. I'm seated in a manual wheelchair with a green shirt. It's kind of a patterned shirt and uh, blonde hair down to my shoulders. And the background is my apartment here in Washington, DC that I share with my husband and our cat. And she might wander through, <laughs> wander through at some point. So. Um, well, I want to talk to you about the Department of State and how we use sport um, to promote U.S. culture and values. The U.S. Department of State really uses sport and athletes in our public diplomacy work. 
And we've actually had some really remarkable success doing it in the, in the disability rights space. I'll just share really quickly one example. Two of our global sports mentoring program initiative leaders have been elected to public office since participating in the program. Both of them are in the audience. And one was recently elected to the parliament in Uganda, and one is a council member in the canton of El Empalme, Ecuador. So I think that's both a tribute to those leaders and who they are, and also to the mentor organizations that they were connected with and the mentors. So I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but just wanted to give you a sense of, of what our work is, is creating in, around disability rights and the possibilities um, that it presents. So backing up a little bit, the Department of State advances national interests and enhances national security for the United States. We do this by informing foreign publics about our American culture and values and expanding and strengthening the relationship between the people and government of the United States and citizens of the rest of the world. And a lot of this work really doesn't get much play or visibility here in the US. We go about doing our work in the international um, landscape. And sometimes you hear about issues that are percolating um, as it relates to the rest of the world and our interaction with them. But a lot of the work we do really you don't see or hear about. So I'm really, I, I love having the opportunity to talk to both a domestic US audience as well as amazing international leaders that we have the opportunity to engage with. Our disability rights portfolio is in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. And we, and our diplomatic engagement through this Bureau is intended to combat discrimination and abuse against persons with disabilities everywhere and in all its forms. To ensure that disability rights is an integral part of US foreign policy and foreign assistance and to strengthen the capacity of the Department of State's workforce to be able to do disability inclusive diplomacy and ensure disability rights as part of our foreign policy. You've heard a little bit already about the, the breadth of challenges that people with disabilities face in the world. I just want to give you a couple of statistics that I haven't necessarily heard. Um, there are 1 billion of us, 1 billion people with disabilities in the world. And Charlotte, I apologize if you already mentioned that. The worldwide literacy rate for persons with disabilities is 3%. For women with disabilities, it's 1%. And we're, when we're looking at education, 30, 90% uh, of children with disabilities do not attend school. So that correlates with the, with the literacy situation. Women and girls with disabilities are, this is a US statistic, three to four times more likely to experience sexual abuse and violence than girls and women without disabilities. I do the work. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our sports diplomacy division, which is as Candace said, where I started in the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. Sports diplomacy was established officially in 2002. And we have um, a number of, we have four programs. There's the Sports Envoy program, which some of you have participated in. Uh, I believe Karen is a Sports Envoy and probably a, a number of you who are also listening. Uh, we send US Olympic, Paralympic, Deaf Olympic, Special Olympics and professional athletes overseas to work with our embassies and consulates and do sports clinics and speak to youth about American culture and values. Um, and it's a really important part of our outreach because we're able to reach communities that we don't normally reach. The Sports Visitors Program is where we have, um, we invite youth with and without disabilities and coaches to the US for two weeks to learn about American culture and values and also sport and how sport is organized in the US. The International Sports Programming Initiative is a competitive grant program. Um, and 
a significant number of these grantees are organizations that have adaptive sports as a, as a major part of their mission. So persons with disabilities definitely participate in our SERP through those programs. And I should also mention the sports visitors programs. I think about 40% of the most recent um, data uh, were um, programs that were disability specific programs. And finally, the Global Sports Mentoring Program. This program um, initially was developed to empower girls and women through sports. And there's, there's a wonderful partnership with ESPNW. And we have a network of women leaders around the world who came through this program since um, 2012 is when it first launched. Incredible women. We, the program is so effective that we decided to, um, to replicate it. And we decided that disability sport was an area that, you know, that would really benefit from this type of mentorship program. Our partner in this program is the University of Tennessee Center for Sport, Peace and Society, and they just do a phenomenal job um, on the program. I also want to give a shout out to um, our partners in this program. We have US leaders and organizations that host these international leaders for a month in their facilities, and they spend every day with them, helping them learn about how to do sports marketing, business skills, um, all of the types of skills that they're looking to learn from us so that they can apply it to the work they're doing back home to increase um, adaptive sports opportunities for people with disabilities. So disability inclusion content features prominently in all of our sports exchanges. And we make sure that we are taking a rights-based approach to establish sport, sports programming, whether it's for youth, um, youth with disabilities, for example, or we provide clear justification for directing resources to these efforts because they're um, directly connected to our foreign policy goals. One of the things that these sports exchanges do is provide an entry point into local communities. And I mentioned this previously, but um, US government officials don't necessarily have access to all communities, um, especially marginalized and multi multiply marginalized communities. So sport is a great way to, to kind of present that entry point. Um, we know that sport empowers people and enhances quality of life. It, it enables us to promote human rights. Uh, it also strengthens our advocacy and awareness efforts and skills. So we work with our, um, especially our international leaders in the mentoring program on how to educate their government officials about the importance of sport for persons with disabilities. Um, we also use sport as a platform for training the next generation of leaders. And we use sport to educate and train mainstream sports people and fans of sport. So lots of ways to apply it to the other prior policy priorities that we have uh, in our foreign policy work. So a little bit more about the Sport for Community program. We've had 79 sport leaders come through the program since 2016 from 49 countries. It's a global network dedicated to growing adaptive sport. There are Paralympic executives, world champion athletes, disability rights advocates, coaches, administrators, and educators who return home to launch significant positive social impact programs in their communities. So far, they've reached collectively 7 million people through social media campaigns and they are directly serving 30,000 people with disabilities and coaches through their initiatives. Sport is a relatable, highly visible stage upon which athletes' performances chip away at disempowering stereotypes. In support of US foreign policy, the US Department of State works to remove barriers and create a world in which people with disabilities enjoy human rights on an equal basis with others. 
When leveraged thoughtfully and strategically, sports serve as a platform for us to champion other foreign policy priorities, disability rights and inclusion, youth empowerment, gender equality, health and wellness, conflict resolution, and entrepreneurism. We really value this tool. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kim. And thank you so much. And uh, I think we've got Karen Korb up next here to yeah. final panelist, not, and yeah, I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> And thank you so much for your tireless and endless, your endless work um, in the space of human rights and sports. I admire you tremendously um, as a role model to women and girls with disabilities globally. So thank you. Um, I've had the privilege of working on multiple global sports envoys, as well as the global sport mentorship program, all led by your department. Um, in partnership with the University of Tennessee's Center for Sport, Peace and Society, which is headed up by Dr. Sarah Hillier. Hi, Dr. Sarah Hillier. Um, you know, uh, through Lakeshore Foundation, we've been a mentor organization. And just like you said, it's amazing what you can create in a convened space and in collaboration to co-power those in the global arena of sport and human rights. Um, I've also noticed there's quite a few of our mentees uh, on this site today. So hi to everybody. And now let's go to Vladimir Chuk. And Vladimir, I don't have a story to tell about you, but um, I do have the distinct privilege of introducing you. So Vladimir is the executive director of the International Disability Alliance and responsible for coordinating the IDA Secretariat and advocacy within the United Nations system. He is engaged in the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs 2030 Agenda, in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, also known as the CRPD. He is a member of the Policy Board for the United Nations Partnership to promote the rights of persons with disabilities, as well as the interagency support group to the CRPD. IDA was instrumental in establishing the Global Action Disability Group, also known as GLAD, which is a disability inclusive donors coordination mechanism. Recently, IDA signed a historic cooperative agreement to advance the rights of persons with disabilities and jointly commit to use Parasport as a vehicle to drive the human rights agenda forward, to create strategic inclusive communication campaigns and collaborate on major events such as the International Paralympic Committee's Inclusion Summit and the Global Disability Summit. Vladimir is based in the IDA New York office. Welcome Vladimir, we are delighted to have you today with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karen. We, we will have to work on making our story, right? Somewhere. <laughs> so, so my name is Vladimir Chuk. I am, I am a Serbian-American, uh, born and raised in, in Belgrade, Serbia. And I am a white male, uh, he, him. I never did this. This is my, my, my first time that I have to introduce myself like this. Um, and I wear a gray suit, purple shirt, purple tie. I wear gray sweatpants, but that you cannot see, luckily. Uh, and yes, I have a COVID-19 haircut and, he, and I'm reporting from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from my apartment where I live with my wife and my, and my daughter, Lona. So I will speak today a little bit about what we do at the International Disability Alliance, and then a little bit about partnership with, with Paralympic uh, Committee. So, so basically, International Disability Alliance is a global organization of persons with disabilities. We have 14 large global and regional networks that bring together more than 1,100 national organizations from 182 countries of the world. So we, we have pretty much uh, uh, through our members, we have membership in, in every single country of the world. We have even representation in, uh, in North Korea, et cetera, et cetera. 
So what we do, first of all, we work in, in, in Geneva and New York with, uh, with the UN system to make UN system work disability, disability inclusive. We do this with a with number of partners and a number of people that are joining this call today are working with us side by side. We work with, um, with, with countries uh, that are member states to the UN to, to, to recommend and, and suggest advances in disability rights. So simply when, whenever there is uh, some negotiation going on in the UN, we would uh, review that, that negotiation, analyze, and then propose a language that will further advance rights of persons with disabilities. And then we recommend this to a number of countries, and then they bring that forward in the, in, in, in the negotiation process. And then little by little through this diplomatic work, we, we advance. And that's how we got Agenda 2030. That's how we, we got SDGs. SDGs did not come, uh, come out of blue. It came after a lot of negotiation, uh, a lot of advocacy um, that, that my colleagues and also our partners did in, in Geneva and New York. Next, we, we work in, in Geneva with the CRPD committee, which is a body that reviews reports uh, that countries produce uh, uh, to demonstrate implementation of the convention locally. So what we do, we support organizations of persons with disabilities uh, from, from many countries of the world to prepare parallel reports and to then to come to Geneva and engage in front of CRPD com committee with their governments and thus establish accountability mechanism so that, so that they can hold them accountable when they go back home and make sure that their governments really will implement what, what they say that they will do when they were meeting with, with CRPD committee. Next, what we do is we, we do a lot of capacity building, especially in a global south. We have a, a big program that is called Bridge CR, uh, CRPD SDGs uh, training, which, which brings all types of people with disabilities, all types of disabilities, absolutely all. Um, and we have really unique system of uh, provision of reasonable accommodation. I think that just that is, uh, is, is very interesting. Uh, we have, uh, we trained thus far more, more than 1,000 organizations uh, through, this, uh, through this process. Uh, and, and like I said, it is primarily done in the Global South. Uh, the, then we, we are recently engaging also with the humanitarian response where we work with the major providers of, of humanitarian action, humanitarian aid, in the first place UN, but also many others to make sure that, that persons with, with disabilities will be included and recognized. Finally, recently, we also started to work with, um, uh, with the peace and security agenda. A security Council just recently adopted in, in 2019, before COVID uh, recently adopted um, a resolution on inclusion of persons with, with disabilities in, in conflict. This is groundbreaking, as you very well know, that, uh, that persons with disabilities were uh, extremely in, in a horrific way used during the conflict or simply left behind in, a, in, in, a, in times of crisis. So we, we, uh, we worked with a number of countries to change this. So now we have actually a tool that, that guarantees UN would consult people with disabilities uh, whenever they're going to, to the field. And also they will have to count and include how they, um, they basically provide programming when they go into into conflict uh, settings. So a lot of a lot of uh, is a lot of things are done, and uh, we had very many advances. Like like you mentioned at the, uh, during my introduction, that we also established donor coordination mechanism. Glad we were also co-hosting um, the first global disability summit. Um, and we had really very many successes up to last year when we were hit by COVID, when, uh, when really everything changed. And we were quickly reminded how, how weak our message is, how still disability rights is nowhere from where it should be. And we were quickly reminded that discrimination is alive and, and well. Uh, and uh, uh, then we decided to do something about it. So we started advocating and 
uh, we were we we were quite successful quite quickly to reverse some of of the discriminatory policies in especially in a triage. Um, so uh, we didn't really engage too much in uh, in the sport except when sport comes as a resolution that was negotiated uh, by governments by member states. Then we would engage and make sure that they that these resolutions are in line with the CRPD, obviously. But we we were we are not sports organization. And then suddenly we were approached by Paralympic Committee, and we it was very very interesting partnership. And we are we decided to 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 explore and pursue. And then so we signed MOU uh, with IPC. And so now we are planning to implement a set of activities. First of all, will be global campaign that was that that Charlotte I believe mentioned at the beginning of this session. That will uh, that that will try to really uh, capture audience and bring the the rights of persons with disabilities forward. And we will use obviously uh, Paralympic Games as the as the galvanizing moment of this campaign. But it will start uh, during summer, and it will have many components, including um, painting with with light, with light painting some of the key buildings around the. Uh, World Empire State Building, or for uh, for example, Eiffel Tower, painting them in purple. It was decided that uh, that color of disability is purple. Don't ask me why. I don't really know. Uh, and uh, so that will be one of these campaigns. So to draw attention to the public, to people with disabilities. Uh, IDA is sitting on the committee on, uh, uh, on the steering committee of this campaign, and we are making sure that it will be done in line with the CRPD principles. So uh, we expect a, a lot from this partnership. We will also try to connect inclusion summit that, it, that is happening one day before Paralympic Games with the Global Disability Summit, uh, which IDA is co-hosting. The first one in London, and the next one, 2022, will be in Norway. Um, so we are, we are trying to bring this conversation. So we are trying simply to bring sports to the global disability movement. And vice versa, we are trying to bring uh, disability rights movement perspectives into the in, into Paralympic Games uh, and to 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 Paralympians. Let's see how this will work. We are very much excited on both sides. I think that we established wonderful collaboration, and I'm really optimistic that 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 something positive will come out of it. Thank you very much for your uh, for for giving me a chance to uh, to speak here. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you so much. And this relationship that is just really beginning to blossom that Ida has with the IPC is, you know, beyond exciting because that really has been a missing piece in the sports movement. And I think in the disability rights movement is engaging with athletes because, because that that hasn't been really intuitive, I think, beyond those of us that have been involved with sport and we started to engage in different human and disability rights activities. So with this campaign, uh, cause I have a, a question for you, that's from me right away. Uh, with this campaign, what is, and just one thing that Ida hopes to be able to achieve in, in participating with this campaign, what will it bring forward for the International Disability Alliance in, as you said earlier, you know that, that we were weak in our messaging in disability and, and how, how will this be able to improve that? Right, I, I think that like, you know, generally we are always like spinning in the same, in the same circles and the, uh, you know the fact that we know each other that are on this call is nice but also it's not very nice because we should be bringing other people outside of these circles so it, so i think as long as as we have uh, this kind of situation i believe that we are uh, we are not achieving what we should and, and and i think that we need to change we need to change uh, dramatically change narrative around disability and uh, i think that this is a unique opportunity that we have now with IPC campaign, basically they have IPC has a really significant 
uh, capacity to reach people. Uh, and then we have also a mandate and we have capacity to bring our members to. So I think it's a kind of good marriage in this sense. Uh, and I, I believe that it, it will result. So basically we want to change the narrative we, we, and we want to make sure that, that this campaign will be done in a CRPD with, with CRPD having in mind so that we, that we do like human rights uh, principles. So that is, that is a goal that, that we are hoping to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. And we have a couple of questions from the audience and I think Karen's got one that she's going to bring forward. Let's see, we've got a couple in our, in our Q and A box, but let me grab uh, Israel. Um, so I think this is a general question for the entire panel uh, and you can choose who'd like to, to answer it. Israel asks, how can development partners support sports among persons with disabilities in developing countries? Perhaps Charlotte, you want to answer that? I can, I can start and hand it over. I'm sure Anne will have much to say on this as well. Um, so, you know, I think again, as I mentioned from the perspective of the bank, uh, we work through governments. Um, we typically work through ministries of finance, but then we work with sec sector ministries. Uh, so how can we ensure that we are including persons with disabilities in sports is to, as I said, if we're working on a sports project, supporting a sports project, supporting a well-being project, supporting a health project, build in a sports component. And then within the sports component, be sure to identify specific indicators for persons with disabilities. Because if you don't call it, if you don't name it, it's not going to happen. It's really important to, to, to capture it. Um, and that way, people will report out on it, well, A, we'll do it, and B, we'll report out on it. And that's really important. And that way you build it into the DNA of the project. And so I would say, for me, that's an important piece. The other piece is to have um, organizations of persons with disabilities, sports organizations, putting pressure on their governments to open that room and that space to ensure that persons with disabilities are being included. Um, and then I think the CRPD is always an important tool to have in your back pocket or, you know, in your side pocket, because it provides you, it provides you um, the rights and knowing the CRPD um, is important. And I say that, you know, mindful of the fact that we have not ratified the CRPD, but this is something for us to think about. How do we galvanize ourselves and the thinking around you? around getting to ratification and using this instrument um, to, to advance, advance uh, sports for development. Thank you, Charlotte. Did it... Oh, sorry, sorry, Candace, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I mean, Anne, <laughs> I was looking at Anne's, uh, Anne's image. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Karen, because I know that Anne had to leave. She had a hard stop. Ah, okay, and... so why don't we jump, why don't we jump to another question? So I know that um, we had a participant, Erin Brown from the Bahamas, and her question was, uh, and I'm assuming her because I don't know pronouns here. So how can nations like the Bahamas connect about current projects we are working on to launch in sports development? Again, general question for our panel. I'll take a stab at it. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, well, one of the things is it's, it's connection. So depending on what the sport is or what the mission statement is of the goals of the sports is start building, you know, partnerships. But, you know, like Vladimir said, a lot of us may or may not know each other on, this, on the work, but there's a distinction between and people who actually are on the ground. So I would say to you, build a partnership with your, your local government, build a partnership with the community so that you can walk hand in hand and then take it out to the larger society and see who's there with you. You have to meet people where they are in order to bring them along with you to understand the importance of sport and total community. But that's just a, that's an old organizer's tool is to meet people 
bring them in, give them the caveat to see why this is important, make it something that, you know, for lack of a better word, is sexy to their, um, to their humanity, uh, and just, and really stay true to the mission that sport is sport, but it's really about the essence of positive, healthy human interaction, and that that is the crux of what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. I think we maybe have time for two more questions and a possible comment. And the comment that I'm reading um, is from Mark Johnson. He says, as mentioned, athletes used to do their thing and activists did theirs. So much progress since the Congress days at the 1996 Paralympic Games. Thanks to all those involved, the future is bright. Thank you, Mark, for your comment. Um, also, Doug Garner asks, this is again for the entire panel. How do you balance compliance versus social justice in advocacy? They're one in the same. They're one in the same. Um, if you're going to talk about social justice, the reason you have a social justice movement is because there are large parts of your society that have by pattern practice and policy been set aside. So when you when you're marching for equity around gender equality, sports equality, disability equality, that means there have been fractures in your community that have long lasted. So social justice and compliance are one and the same. If you want to be compliant, that means you are addressing the human as a human versus bifurcating their identity. So it's you can say, I don't want to put a ramp, but that indicates that you're not really here to do the work for humans. That means you want to be shallow. So compliance and social justice are one and the same. Yeah, absolutely, Keith. I echo your comments on that. You know, and as we continue this conversation, especially in the specifically in the United States, we really need to take a a deeper look at overlaying dis disability justice principles and all that we do. Um, Candace, I don't think we have any more time for another question. So I'm gonna toss the ball back to you, so to speak. I got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this out with, check out USID's website and think about becoming a member because our grassroots movement really needs people and we're, we're training people in advocacy. Thank you to all of our esteemed panel for sharing so much with us, you know, deepening our knowledge about sport and all the ways it's used in building our inclusive society with advocacy, influencing policy, affecting our humanity, dismantling bias, and your work in organizations is so important. And thank you for sharing that with our audience. Thank you audience for being here. Uh, without you, you know, we got nobody to talk to. So. <laughs> We're really hoping that you can share the word. This is gonna be posted on the USID website. Also our collaborators, the Foundation for Global Sports Development, as well as Sidewinder Films. Collaboration is the key. Partnerships are the key. That's the way we build a bigger pie. That's how we get these done. And thank you to USID's board of directors for really getting the word out and being a part of USID because Without that, the work can't get done. We need each and every one of us to be a part of this. It's not hard to be an advocate. I mean, sometimes it's just making a phone call. That's all it is. And thank you so much, Karen and Isabel for really steering this ship today and tossing the ball back and forth. And grateful for everyone. Please have a wonderful afternoon. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.